All right, good morning. Uh, so I'm going to tell you uh, a couple of things that Ernest Holmes uh, teaches us in the textbook. He says that if we are dealing with a universal principle, why should we set any limit to its power? So remember, he says that God is principle, but God is also presence, that God is love and God is law. He says the law of God is infinite. So from the spiritual viewpoint, there is no incurable. And I have to pause, you know, because I think about all the times we encounter things that seem like they are incurable. He says disease is largely a state of mind. Mm. And he says we can hardly say that a state of mind is incurable. I love that. I love that. Says, because thought is constantly changing and forever taking, uh, taking on new ways of expression. So we can always change our thought to a better state, right? Now, he goes on and he teaches us that it's better to not dwell, or better not to dwell uh, too much on the negative, and to affirm the presence of God is way better than to deny the presence of evil. To keep affirming that God is now here. God is in the midst of this. God is present here. Even in this situation, this difficulty, this condition I'm dealing with, God is present here. So one of the things that he says that I've always loved about healing is that healing is a revealing of the spiritual truth. Now, we were all born with a great spiritual truth within us. You know, So you could look at that as the divine blueprint of your being, but you were born, I was born, everyone was born whole, perfect, and complete. And so if we are not, um, however we would say it, I'm going to say healed, then all that means is there is stuff on top of the perfection that God created us to be in the beginning. So the thing that I want to work with today for us, and I thought we'd do a little piece of inner work at the end of this, is this idea of harnessing our imagination in service of healing. Now, there's been a lot of study around this in the last 40 years or so, but 40 years ago, nobody had heard of this. This was really kooky babuki back then. But now, of course, there's been all kinds of scientific research uh, that there, and, and so uh, we understand that there are powerful techniques because just based on what Ernest has already said, there is powerful, deep wisdom within us already. Now, it's not like God ever knows what we need to do but isn't telling because there is no withhold in divine consciousness. God, spirit, the infinite, only knows to give of itself. So this idea is about making ourselves receptive so that the inherent wisdom, the God wisdom, the God truth within us can come forward in a way that makes sense to us and is absolutely usable. Let me tell you how I think this, how this plays out in the evolution of consciousness. If you look at the story in the Bible, that what comes, what's happening when Jesus is crucified is um, it says that when he was crucified, the veil in the temple was rent, that the veil was ripped open. I don't know if anybody remembers ever hearing that or reading that. So within the temple was the Holy of Holies, the most sacred place in all of Judaism was inside the temple, and it was this Holy of Holies. Only the high priest could part the curtain and step into the Holy of Holies. This was such a big deal that when the high priest was going to part the curtain and go into the Holy of Holies, they tied a rope around his leg just in case he died while he was in there because nobody else could go in. And the plan was that if he should die while he's in there, we can at least pull him out. And then we can make somebody else the high priest, and then they can go in. So when Jesus was crucified, it says that the veil was rent. The, the curtain was torn in half that went into the Holy of Holies. So what this meant symbolically was that that, that which had been so sacred that only the high priest had access to now everyone had access to. It was no longer just for the high priest, or the high mucky muck, somebody who was special. It was now available to everyone. And so science of mind teaches us that healing is available to everyone regardless of what the condition is. Now, we don't say we know what the healing is going to look like, 
But we do believe that because healing is a revealing of the spiritual truth, there is always the possibility, what's always available, is that greater, a greater expression of the spiritual truth that's already within us can come forward. So I think that one of the ways to look at this is that when we think about health, that health is a state of balance and wholeness. And, and when I think about it, it's also dynamic because it's always in the process of changing. You know, there's a wide spectrum of health, isn't there? There's health way over here, and then there's all these things in between that are also health, and then there's health over here. Health, health cuts a really, really wide path, and, and I understand is different for each of us. So one of the things we could ask is, why is healing not happening, right? That's something that people will often ask, you know? How can I get unblocked, because in some way, maybe I am probably blocked. Now, let's be clear. In the science of mind, healing comes from within. And yes, Ernest says, take the pill and take the prayer, and maybe someday your consciousness will evolve to a place where you don't need the pill. But in the meantime, know that God works through the pill, so take the pill and take the prayer. All right, so he's really clear on that. But healing comes from within. So if you take the pill, and I would never say don't take the pill, know that the power of God is what's working through the pill. That the pill itself is not the power, that we believe in the science of mind, that God works through any medium that we individually are receptive to. So just know that before you chug that pill, that God is the power that's working through this pill for my highest and greatest expression of life. Because healing comes from within. And so there are lots of different ways that healing is facilitated in our life. Now, somebody uh, the other night was asking me about um, why did Ernest Holmes call it treatment. You know, when we do an affirmative prayer, Ernest used the word treatment. Well, you have to go back to like the 1920s. And in the 1920s, there were not chiropractic treatments and hair treatments and nail treatments and massage treatments and all these different kinds of things that people went to the practitioner or the minister. The practitioner or minister prayed in the affirmative and they had had a treatment because they expected to get results from the treatment, right? You wouldn't go to the chiropractor and saying, well, this isn't going to do any good, but I'm going to give him 150 bucks anyway, right? I mean, you wouldn't do that. You would expect results if you went to see um, somebody who's going to give you some kind of medical treatment, right? So I think optimum health, I would say, is healthy on every level of our being, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and physically. <laughs> Excuse me. You know, in, um, in Eastern medicine, they talk about that the source of physical problems are invisible. That's very much like the science of mind. You know, that a physical illness is always preceded by an invisible illness in, in Eastern teachings. So it's more important to actually diagnose the invisible illness than it is the visible illness, right? And so now, you know, we live in an age of what they call integrative medicine, so we're interested in spiritual, mental, emotional, and physical. And in history, this has not always been so. Um, so I think, I believe, that to work with imagery is an enormously powerful thing, an enormously powerful tool, regardless of what it is we believe needs healing in our life. And you know, there's now a long history of athletes using this and stage performers, but also now we have a body of material using imagery and healing for treatments of cancers and all kinds of other things. The, our mind interacts with our body in lots of different ways, more than we can probably even specify, I believe. So, But, uh, so the important thing, though, that I think that we all understand this as students of science of mind is that there are connections between what's happening in our mind, I'll go here for mind, and the rest of our body, right? They're not separate. At an earlier time, we thought they were separate, and now we know they are absolutely not. So how to take advantage of these connections? You know, well, nowadays you see that um, there's all kinds of great stuff happening with hypnosis and biofeedback and, of course, meditation and certainly, certainly, certainly guided imagery. So I think 
we have the capacity to harness the power of our imagination to assist us in creating greater healing in our life. Um, because things first appear on the imagined level before they show up on the physical level. We teach that, that things are in consciousness first before they actually manifest out here in the world of physical form. So um, the ancient, I thought this was interesting, the ancient Greeks thought that the imagination was actually an organ in the body with a function, that it was so important, it was so valued, it was so prized, you know, um, because the imagination would modulate uh, the outside reality and, and the inside physiology. Now, you know, we've talked about this over the years, I guess, that our will, our human will, plays a part. But our imagination, I believe, is so very powerful that it is actually the, uh, the modulator I guess, of, of, of feelings and our physiology. So I think that because Ernest teaches us, and, we, and there's a lot you know, in psychology now that says that, that imagery, images are the language of the subconscious or unconscious mind, right? Now, I believe that within each of us, our body knows what we need to do, how we need to be to heal, right? Because remember, that when I say our body, I would say that's the spirit of God within us knows exactly what we need to do to create greater healing in our life. And God does not withhold any of that information. So we have to get out of the way right, and allow that information to come to us, right? So what my experience has shown me is that people, now nobody here, of course, but people like to worry. It's a go-to. I don't know what else to do. I guess I'll worry. Gee, they didn't answer the phone. I guess I'll worry. Oh, there's a bump on my body. I guess I'll worry. What was that cough? I think I better worry. On and on and on. Now, worry is a, is, is a problem prayer. When you worry, you are praying the problem. Right? Because, it's, because essentially you're negative, you're in a, a place of negative imagining. You know, people worry themselves sick. Again, I know nobody here, but people we probably know really well can actually worry themselves into a state about something and not a state of great health. You know what I'm talking about. And people will say, oh, I was worried sick about you. You say, well, why? I was fine. I was absolutely fine. Well, I didn't hear from you. Well, I know, I wasn't available. Oh, but I was so worried. And it's like, well, why would you do that? So first, let me say, worry is very unscience of mindy, OK? It is. It's very unscience of mindy because people go to that place of the worst case scenario when they're worrying, right? I would, they never say, I was so worried that your blood pressure was going to be perfect. Nobody ever says that. <laughs> I was so worried that you'd see the doctor and the doctor say your weight was perfect. You don't know, no, that's, oh, your cholesterol, that's not what people are saying. Worry is negative imagining, you know? And people do that, they worry themselves sick. If, so, so I was thinking, you know, if we didn't have imagination, we would probably actually have no stress. And we all know stress is the enemy, right? But if we had no imagination, because what people are often imagining is what's creating the stress for them, again and again and again in their life. So imagery, I think, is a way of thinking that involves all of our senses, or as many as we can get involved. And what we want to do is we want to visit that place where we are uh, peaceful, calm, happy, well, kind of your happy place. That's what we'll call We'll say your happy place. We all have a happy place, right? Mine is often on the sofa <laughs> with a dog on my head and at my feet. That's sort of how it goes. Um, but that would not be the place I would use for my imagery. That would not be the image. Um, if we visit that place, our happy place, um, how I believe this works is that the healing energies within our body know, oh, this is what I'm supposed to do. This is where I'm supposed to kick, kick in. This is where I'm supposed to get to work. So I think this is about concentrating and focusing our mind on, on what 
we choose rather than what just shows up, you know? Because what this does, when we choose, it changes our feelings, it changes our physiology, and I believe it stimulates our body's own innate abilities, right? So we can also use our imagination to, um, to make inquiry into how we're feeling. You know, that, that our body, our emotions, our deeper thought, we can have a conversation with a part of us that may be hurting, right? So I think it's not just imaging the good outcome. I think that um, we, we can receive an image. You know, you ask, you know, what will help my body heal most effectively, most efficiently? And then be quiet and see what comes to you. Now, again, I hold that it's nothing that's going to be really difficult. You know, when you say, what's going to help my body heal? God is not going to talk to you in a language you don't understand. And I think we often act like God will talk to us in some crazy foreign language with mathematical formulas and all these things. And that's, no, God's, of course God is going to talk to you in a way you understand. Um, you know, in our culture today, what people generally want is for all the negative symptoms to go away, right? Isn't that true? I just, poof, make my symptoms go away. Make my symptoms go away. But if we see a symptom as more than just a symptom, that the symptom is also giving us some feedback. And that feedback is telling us that something is going on inside that is not as it could, should be. What do I need to know here? That's a really empowering inquiry. What do I need to know? This is here, because we say in the science of mind, if something is so, there's a reason why it's so. So if this thing is here, there's a reason why it's here. What do I need to know? You know? I think it's interesting that we don't care better about ourselves, just generally, that people don't care better about themselves. Mm -hmm. I think that's just really amazing. Because, you know, 40, 30 years ago, Louise Hay was teaching us, right, at at, at the beginning of that wave of metaphysical understanding, how important it was to have, if you don't like to say, oh, I, I love myself, if that's uncomfortable, have a personal high regard for yourself, okay? So if you don't want to stand in the mirror and say, I love you, I love you, I, I get it, I get it. But, but if you have an unconditional positive high regard for yourself, I think that's the same thing. Because the whole thing with the imagery is, I believe it can connect us to whatever lives in us. There's no reason not to work with imagery. You know, most people in the population say that they are visually oriented, right? But then I'll talk to somebody and somebody will say, oh, I'm a terrible visualizer. I don't visualize. I can't visualize. And I'll say, okay, tell me, what does your living room look like at home? I say, what? I say, no, just describe your living room. Tell me what your living room looks like. And so they launch into telling me what their living room looks like. Or, or you know, I say, tell me about the favorite pet you've ever had. Oh, I can't decide. Well, tell me about one. Tell me one, right? There's no reason not to work with imagery because I think that because this is a step in empowering our own destiny. See, because nobody's telling you what to do. Really, you're, it, it comes from within you. You receive inner wisdom, and you get to choose what you're going to focus on. So I think we've got to be willing to feel what you feel in order to expand your consciousness about, about this experience. So obviously, I like this kind of work. I think this is really interesting. I think it's really fascinating. And I think probably the best thing we could do is actually practice it a little bit now. So I'm going to invite you to do that with me. So get yourself relaxed here, right? Because clearly, relaxation is good for healing. You know? That relaxation stimulates what they call the body's healing response. Right? So I would just ask you to. Um, Close your eyes if you want. If you don't, that's OK, too. It works. And now just focus on your breath for a moment. Notice that you're breathing in and breathing out. And let your body relax part by part. So we'll start down at the feet. So on an in-breath, Take in fresh energy, oxygen, vitality, 
aliveness, and on an outbreath, let go, releasing, moving toward deeper relaxation, releasing tension. And you might silently say to yourself, peace to my body, peace to my body. And so just invite, allow relaxation in any place in your body where you know that you tend to hold tension, just tell that place to relax, to release, to let go right now. And so we'll just scan through our body, starting at the feet. Relax one foot, then the other. Relax up your legs, hips, pelvis, lower back. Relaxing deeply and comfortably. Relax your chest and rib cage, your shoulder blades, your back and spine. Allow them to soften. Your neck, your arms, down to your wrists and hands, your palms, your fingers, your thumbs. Let your face be soft and at ease, your jaw. Oh, let that tension in your scalp and forehead go, your eye muscles. Let your tongue be soft in your mouth. Now, completely relaxed, go to that place of your body's own healing abilities. There is a place within you, a God space, that knows exactly what you need. So see yourself in a beautiful place, your happy place, a place you love to be, beautiful, safe, secure, private, powerful. And imagine yourself there. And that while you are there, your body is repairing and renewing itself on every level. And enjoy it. You don't have to do anything and just allow it to be good for you. Know that every breath that you release, your body can repair and restore and renew. So in a centered, relaxed place, let this be a place of healing and renewal for you. Soak up what feels good. Drink in what nourishes you. Breathe in what energizes you. And accept all that is healing to you. Because your body knows how to heal whatever is needed. And so we'll just continue on in our prayer knowing that the fullness of the allness of God's Spirit is here, that we are surrounded and filled. And I know by being together today, we have a strong image of wholeness and perfection and healing for ourselves, but also for those we love. We see them in our mind's eye and wrap our spiritual arms around them. We know that God is present right where they are. And just as we are blessed by being together, we get to be a blessing by holding them in consciousness as well. Our parents and children, our siblings, our friends and loved ones. We let our prayer be a blessing energy on the face of the earth, touching hearts and minds of all people everywhere, knowing that God is fully present. We bless our church, all churches everywhere, synagogues and temples and mosques and ashrams, all paths to God. And I'm certain that we are blessed by being together. That the wholeness and perfection of God that was created before the beginning exists within us right now, and we say yes to it. And so with a full heart, I release this word. I know it's done, and so it is. Together we all say, Amen.